The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. And uh, I want to welcome Mr. Chen Mihai. Chris uh, is known to a number of you, like at least some of you I see here are already to him as faculty, but um, to the students who have been last week at the Media Lab, Chris is directing the Computing Culture Group. Correct. That's good, yeah. And um, yeah, but what is his link to Kaposh might be very interesting to Mark, and if you know him as faculty, but um, where does his research and the activities of oh, these students basically linked to what we have been discussing before, uh, speaking about social responsibility and also questions of ethics in neuroscience uh, and technology at MIT. And um, Chris is also linked to us because he's also practicing as visual artist and um, therefore it's um, yeah, being open to us looking at those in the future. So welcome, well, Chris. Thank you. Hi, good evening. So um, I'm going to uh, start maybe talking a little bit more about my work uh, as an artist before coming to MIT, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, this this research group that uh, I'm running at the Media Lab, uh, because there's uh, there's relationships. Uh, I hope to kind of show you a couple of the relationships um, between it. But uh, basically, since the early 90s, I've been working uh, to try to understand how to make um, a better material world, um, a, a world with uh, technologies in it that are different from the ones that we're seeing right now. And, and the process has been a, kind of a long one. Um, uh, it started with me working in the past, trying to create uh, what I called historical fictions of technology. So I would uh, do a lot of research into the history of technology, find a particular moment, and then design a technology for that moment that didn't exist. Um, and then I worked uh, uh, a little bit more in the present, just for a couple of years, developing uh, contemporary technologies. And um, uh, I'm hoping um, uh, I'm hoping uh, now that we're we're kind of extending that uh, with the research group to some degree. Um, I've been starting off uh, with this slide actually because I'm really disorganized and. Um, I'll forget uh, what it says and, unless I see it once in a while. So um, I've been putting it in all my talks. Um, but also because I, uh, I want to understand a little bit more about what it means, um, uh, this in the following slide. So I figure you've had time to read this one um, as you're waiting. Um, and this is a second one. This is from a philosopher of science named Langdon Winter. Um, and in it, he's basically saying that um, the Aristotle quote that you saw before, in which Aristotle said that he could only imagine a slave-free society in one situation. Um, Aristotle, of course, being a slave owner, um, uh, as sort of the founders of this country, um, had the idea that, uh, that it would be impossible to have a society without slaves unless you could have machines, essentially. And so he talks about harps that can play their own music um, or uh, uh, weaving machines that could weave on, on and of themselves um, without a human operator. Um, and what Langdon Winter pointed out in the 1970s was um, that Aristotle starts this tradition of kind of equating machines with slavery um, uh, and, and saying that, that in order to, to end slavery, we need to develop these machines. Um, and in fact, you know, one can argue that what we've done is we've instantiated a material world where everything around us is essentially acting as slaves, where everything around us is instrumental, serving a need. Um, a very different world than we lived in um, uh, before Aristotle. So, so Winner's point is that the theme of mastery and domination is really common in science and engineering. And um, I kind of noticed that from a very early point in my career, long before I was interested in art. Um, I was working as a designer in a, uh, a company that was essentially a consultancy for um, Fortune 50 companies. Uh, I was a college dropout, um, and uh, uh, but but I got this great job because I had some technical skills. Um, and as I worked in the job, I got to see how business worked. I got to see how industrial design worked. 
Um, I got to see industrial designers at these different companies coming up with ideas for technology, and I looked around and I saw an incredibly barren landscape, um, a landscape to me that was just kind of devoid of anything interesting, you know, it precluded the idea of anything interesting happening with technology. And I began to notice, you know, at this point I said, well, I'd like to get involved in technology. So I started looking at engineering schools. Um, is that camera on? And I found, yeah, okay, damn it. Uh, and I found that the engineering schools had a pedagogy which centered around, uh, for instance, if you were in computer science, you would do problem sets of bank accounts and you would learn about floating point numbers as a way to show that if you use floating point numbers, you would eventually lose billions of dollars in your transactions. And, you know, I don't want to work in a bank. Um, no one I know wants to work in a bank. Uh, and so, so the idea of having to go through years of doing problem sets with these kinds of examples seemed to me, uh, you know, just onerous beyond belief. And, um, and I also noticed that the examples were often um, ones that instantiated, you know, a, a fundamental belief in, you know, for instance, banks and market capital or um, uh, in, you know, if, I, if you were studying computer vision, you're given examples from military applications. And, um, the, the pedagogy is working on that level as well, kind of conveying a, a, a set of ideological principles through the problem sets that you do. Um, so, um, in fact, did anyone see the robot competition? Was it 6 to 70? Is that right? There was one with the humanities versus the. So they had these robots, which were for humanities robots, and, and they had to like go and pick up after the scientists and engineers or something. I forget exactly how it worked, but, but this, this continues, you know, at, at, in MIT um, in the most unexpected places. Um, so as I began to do this work, I, I came across uh, a lot of people who think about science and engineering um, from that pickup perspective, from the humanities, um, including uh, people like Langdon Winter that I showed before, Bruno Latour, and. Um, their premise is essentially that all technology is ideological, and this is um, uh, a door closer that Bruno Latour um, gives an example of in one of his texts. Um, and his point is that, uh, well, you know, a scenario is something like you're working in a, uh, say, a large open work plan office, and um, you've got a cubicle that's near the door, and uh, um, people keep opening the door and they forget to close it after themselves, and you get very cold um, during the winter, and, and so you you do what one does in that situation, just put up a sign on the door saying, please close the door after you um, come in. And of course, uh, as happens, no one closes the door. And so you eventually talk to your manager and you say, look, can we put one of those, does anyone know what these are called? You're all architects, you should. Unbelievable. Okay. I'm, They're actually just called I quit. Closers. I'm just. Uh, so anyway, so automatic door closer, uh, you say to your manager, please, can you buy one of these? And he says, okay, he looks at his budget, he goes, mm, okay, well, uh, sure. And he ends up putting it up and you know, some maintenance guy is, uh, uh, comes with a cordless screwdriver. And so what happens now is that people who come in, uh, they don't even notice the door closes automatically behind them. You're warm, you're very happy. But someone at the other end of the office who's right by the heater, who used to love it when the door was open, is now inconvenienced um, and is sweltering all day long and wishes that the automatic door closer weren't there. And that's, how the very simplest technology is an ideological device. It's, it's helping one particular person uh, with a, a particular kind of, you could say, political agenda that, that works for them, um, and it makes the world a little bit easier for them. Um, and that's what technologies do. They make the world easier for some people. Um, but if you look at the other people, the world isn't necessarily easier for them. Some people might not be inconvenienced, but um, in this case, uh, uh, for my example, they are. So. Um, the Computing Culture Group has been working to try to understand the ideologies and the politics behind um, different technologies. We borrow a lot from uh, 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 various fields like sociology of scientific knowledge, science and technology studies, history of science, less so, but occasionally philosophy of science. We look at these works, um, uh, abstract principles for designing new technologies from them, and try to come up with alternative technologies. And so we essentially, we, we look at what the science the subculture of science and engineering are to start with. And so, as Chris was saying in the last talk, as a young Aero Astro student, he was running into the issue of um, uh, I, people idealizing the F-22 Raptor. Did I get it right? Yeah. Um, you know, which, which is, uh, it's really common. I, I've got a, a student who um, works as a year for me who's a complete peacenik from Vermont. <laughs> 
Um, and uh, and he uh, uh, he's you know absolutely left leaning. Works for non proliferation internships during the summer. He has a, an image of an F twenty two Raptor as his desktop image. Um, so what's interesting is that to be an aero astro um, at MIT to, to means that you're you're committed to the idea of researching what's progress in flight, what's the most advanced principles of flight, building the, the fastest planes or whatever. And inevitably that work is military work. Um, you know, you could end up designing air buses, that's a really attractive word, isn't it? An air bus, but, but, but actually the, the juice, the, the real interesting principles are happening on the military side of even those same companies um, with the Eurofighter and things like that. So, so to do it, you're basically saying this is an entire body of knowledge and if you want to work on making things fly in the most advanced way possible, you are working on instruments of death. And that's a really strange position to be in, I think, for a lot of 18, 19 year olds. Um, uh, and the student has been dropping for me because I'm working on these relatively peaceful UAVs, um, so peaceful they can't fly yet. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a small threat. Um, but, uh, but, you know, but he's doing that because so many of the other drop opportunities have to do with, um, you know, even though ostensibly they're uh, developing flocking UAVs uh, for collaborative automatic flight, you know who the client is in the end. And so doing that kind of work is saying, okay, I'm going to you know, break Pugwash's rules and work on things which I know in one generation are going to be used for autonomous killing machines. Um, so by looking at the subculture of science and engineering, what are the things that students have to buy on to do the research? What kinds of problems do they find interesting? What's a sweet problem? By looking at those kinds of things, we can see, okay, so this is what science and engineering is working on. And at any one time, like an Aero right now, it's a very narrow kind of a pie chunk uh, slice. Sorry. Uh, it's a very narrow pie slice of, of what's possible. If you think of all the things that flight could be for, right now, if you're doing advanced research, it's pretty much military work. Um, uh, and that's true in a lot of other disciplines. Um, and so we try to look at what do the successes of these things include. What, um, what, 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 you know, if you're doing incredible work around this military application, uh, what isn't being done? Um, and then uh, we essentially try to build the technologies that are being missed. And even though not everyone involved in critical technical practice would acknowledge that this is a description of critical technical practice, what we're trying to do is situate ourselves within a kind of larger intellectual movement called a critical technical practice. The phrase was coined by a guy named Philip Agri, who um, uh, was actually an MIT AI guy who read too much Foucault and became adult, um, and uh, uh, is now, I think, working at UCLA in some kind of information system program. But, um, but he left MIT AI because he saw that the, the, the discipline, well, I mean, number one, it's a military science, 98% of AI funding when he was at the lab had come from the DOD at that point. Um, it's a little bit different now, but uh, 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 it's also a little bit less successful, probably. Um, uh, so that, that, that was one of the things that he noticed. Another thing he noticed was that as a discipline, AI was incredibly immune to criticism from outside of its own walls. And it was a, a very self-similar group of researchers who had common interests and ambitions. And when very smart people from outside of AI would point out problems with their fundamental concepts, they would write it off and say these people just don't understand. And so as Agri began to integrate Foucault or Dissertot into some of his AI, some of the understandings he'd gotten about everyday life or, or experience from these authors, people would say, oh, that's philosophy. Philosophy's done nothing for us in 2,000 years. We know nothing more about how the mind works. And, and he thought, well, is that true? You know, and he decided it wasn't, and he ended up having to leave AI. But not before he wrote a really great tell-all book um, uh, called Computation and Human Experience. So I recommend reading that at some point. So anyway, let me go back and show uh, very quickly a little bit of early work um, of myself as an artist beginning to work with technology. And I'll start out with um, stuff from undergrad. My apologies to Rebecca Barron and others in the audience who've seen this before. Um, but this was, uh, this was kind of my undergraduate thesis project, a uh, project called Hunter Hunter. And um, it was developed in uh, 1992 as um, uh, Slovenia was seceding from uh, the former Yugoslavia. And anyone who um, knew anything about that uh, part of the world knew that there was going to be a war. Um, but what was amazing to me was that the international community was doing nothing about it. Um, it was almost like there was this kind of uh, molasses that everyone was stuck in. And what I realized the, the formula was, as I saw this play out, was that, um, that the international community was going to essentially let the war start 
and then look for atrocities to happen, and then eventually send in blue-helmeted peacekeepers. And I thought, well, this is just really weird. Like, the, number one, that everyone knows this is going to happen, but no one's doing anything about it. But number two, um, that we put all of this money as a society. At that point, you know, uh, we just come out of the Reagan and, uh, at which point 50% of our tax dollar was going to military funding. Um, I thought, isn't it crazy that we're putting all this money into defense stuff, but we can't prevent a war from starting um, or, or kind of enforce some kind of policing without atrocities happening. So I started thinking, okay, well, what can I do? And uh, of course, at this point, I was just getting started in the medium. I was going to thrift stores to buy all the electronics and parts, um, uh, thrift stores and surplus stores. And all of these had military surplus. So I was kind of in that, immersed in that area anyway. So I built this thing, which basically has three microphones. And so it can triangulate sound, um, uh, especially sharp, sharp attack sounds, because I didn't know a lot of math back then. Well, I still don't know a lot of math. Um, but so, uh, so it could, it could basically, it's like having three years, sound takes longer to travel to each of them um, from a particular point, and so you can trace it back and find the exact angle that the sound comes from. It then sampled the sound, did uh, essentially a, an attack, sustained decay model of the sound, an envelope sound of the, the way the sound happened, um, and then would pass that through a very, very simple neural network. Um, uh, and would be able to recognize if that sound was probably a gunshot or not. And if it was, then that was a nine millimeter cannon. Um, it would aim exactly where the gunshot came from and then fire back in that direction. And so it was kind of instantiating Hammurabi's eye for an eye, um, the idea of uh, uh, punishing aggression with aggression and would just shoot whoever took the first shot. And so, um, so I thought, you know, you could drop this into Yugoslavia, each of the states, and. Um, you know, just have one every kilometer or so, and, um, uh, and it would kind of prevent it. And of course, I didn't really believe that, but um, what I've learned since coming here is that most engineers and scientists don't believe that their work will really do what they claim it will do when they're trying to sell it. Um, so, and this is it looking around in the gallery. Um, most of the curators made me take out the firing pin. Um, uh, but and then I just show these because it's like it's bitterly bad machining. Um, this is the first time I'd used a lathe or a mill. I was learning assembler. I was um, doing electronics for the first time. So it was a pretty uh, pretty rocky piece. Um, when I got to grad school, I started thinking, um, you know, uh, more in the past, and because I was reading so much history of technology, and so like I said, I, I started doing these projects which were based in. Um, uh, the kind of second half of the 20th century, this kind of the, the founding of kind of modern science, um, post post nuclear science, and, and um, uh, basically what I would do is I would imagine some societal agenda or um, industry that was going to create a technology um, and then make it. And so this, for instance, is one from uh, a hydropower <laughs> consortium um, uh, called American Hydropower Institute. And in the late 1970s, they were going to flood a set of valleys um, in Arizona to create you know, what was going to be the biggest hydropower dam in history. Um, but the recently passed Environmental Protection Act um, uh, would prevent them from doing this because they would cause the extinction of a species of ant. And so uh, rather than go back, what they tried to convince Congress that they were going to do was um, build a machine that would keep the ants alive in perpetuity, so like um, a sort of Smithsonian for the ants. Um, uh, and, um, and so the, the project was presented as the trade show display from uh, Frontiers of Energy 1977 in Las Vegas, um, where they brought these congressional junk kits in to take a look. And so it was sort of a demo. <laughs> a lot of my work is strangely... Um, uh, uh, strangely foreshadowing. Um, so it's essentially a demo by this company of um, what, uh, what, what the ants would live in. So this is the robot that um, lived with the ants. It was sort of a machine for living where the ants would come to the surface of this um, uh, white constrained cube. Um, and uh, the robot would count them, feed them, um, drop food, count them as they're coming to collect the food, um, and then pair them at a rate of um, uh, natural predators um, eating them in the wild. So this is uh, uh, anyone who knows E.O. Wilson from the 1970s, the famous Harvard Rheumologist um, uh, studier of social insects, had this uh, equation that every species in the world was uh, a ratio between uh, their predation and how they were predated by others. And so this was E.O. Wilson's kind of maxim that everywhere in the world that there was a European carpenter ant, 
Um, no matter where it was in Europe, there was always this perfect ratio of predation to prey. Um, and uh, so the machine kind of reproduced that um, uh, and uh, used you know, both a food shaker and then this very bright light and a magnifying glass to pair the, um, pair the ants. Um, and this is the uh, um, DEC20 chromatics uh, interface. And so the installation had the robot uh, working with the ants on the top. And then it had um, these screens, uh, two of which had a promotional video from 1977 that you can see kind of fluttering by on the right. You can find it on YouTube um, uh, with uh, uh, hippies protesting outside the plant and eventually a warm gray-haired industry representative in a hard hat says, why are, you, why are you kids protesting? And the hippies say, you're trying to kill the ants. And the guy says, well, we're not trying to kill the ants. We're trying to create a, a safe space for the ants to live forever. Uh, come on, take a look, and they get introduced to the scientist who explains to them, oh, you know, uh, uh, really this is, um, this is a machine for living, and um, uh, the ants, uh, they can't feel pain, they've got very small brains, and, um, and eventually the hippies understand that the answer isn't less technology, it's more, and so um, what was remarkable, while we were filming this, I, I, I had a show in Finland that I had to prepare for, and I had about four weeks to build the robot and shoot the promotional video, and um, uh, halfway through, our, we had a very tight shooting schedule, and halfway through, I realized that the guy who was playing the scientist wasn't going to be able to hack it. He was a good friend of mine, a very theatrical guy, but it turns out that he couldn't uh, remember his lines at all, and we were trying it for like three hours, and we were way behind our shooting schedule, and then I had to fire him. It was terrible. I had to fire him and, and play the scientist myself. Um, and the funny thing is I would show this in Europe, um, uh, and people would see me on screen, but they would believe that it was really from the 1970s, and so finally people would say, who is playing the scientist? And I would say, oh, my uncle. And then they would be very, but, but I, I would ask people later, why would you believe something so strange, you know, um, such a strange story, and, and the video was kind of campy, it was like not completely serious, and, and they would say, oh, well, you know, we'll believe anything from the US, and this, this turns out to be a very powerful tool uh, that you can use in a lot of work. Um, the, the last piece uh, that I'll show, I think, in this, no, there's two more. Um, this one is from 1968, and this is um, uh, looking at the history of neural networks, which are a kind of a form of computation that uh, models the architecture of the brain rather than some kind of logical process. And, um, and so this one, uh, I created this character named Ilya Prokopov, a uh, Soviet uh, researcher um, at the University of Moscow, who um, was reproducing some experiments from the US from the 1950s um, in perceptrons. And there was this famous, this is actually historical, I'm not lying in, um, uh, this famous experiment by a guy named Frank Rosenblatt, who was part of the Macy conferences, where he built one of these systems that could recognize male and female faces in a portrait. Um, and so he was able to successfully train a group of kind of um, electric synopses and neurons to successfully recognize a male or a female face. And it's great, uh, if you watch NOVA occasionally, they'll show a little bit of the footage of this 1950s British um, uh, science movie announcer going, uh, you know, even this, this man with long hair was successfully parsed as a male. And um, he's kind of surprised and pre-Beatles. -pre um, uh, so so that's, that really happened, and a lot of researchers in the field know about Frank Rosenblatt, and so I speculated uh, that there was a Soviet researcher who was reproducing Frank Rosenblatt's experiments. But in 1962, um, a pair of scientists named Papert and Minsky, um, who, uh, and, and I did this long before I came to the Media Lab, but um, both of them were Media Lab faculty, um, uh, they put out a book called Perceptrons where they proved that these systems had no future and that the future was in symbolic logic processing. Um, and the US military and a bunch of people absolutely believe this. All research in this kind of computation ended in the US for about 20 years, and now it's back big time, and it turns out these incredibly powerful machines, and that book was just wrong. So um, what I was able to do is speculate that this guy, Ilya Prokopov, couldn't afford the book, and so he continued to do the research, and ended up finding that um, rather than outputting an analog wave of you know, high for female and low for male, um, he, well, he was able to successfully train a system so it would recognize men and women very accurately. But, um, but he found that there was noise consistently on some of the images but not on others. And so he began to say, well, what do these images have in common? Okay, so in, you know, it's either high uh, with a bump on it or low with a bump on it, um, but only for some of the photos and, and, and regardless of gender. And so 
he's, he said, okay, well, maybe it's the background. Like, maybe some of the background colors are different. Or maybe uh, some people are wearing, uh, you know, um, kind of uh, proletarian colors, and others are wearing um, kind of, uh, 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 you know, bourgeois colors. And what, what is it about, you know, maybe it's hair color? Is there something that's common across some of these men and women that's generating this second harmonic on the main partial? And he, he kept going back, and you know, eventually he called in the NKPD because one out of every five people was an informant. And so they were able to give him some information about the people whose photos he had taken. And he was able to find that the bump was only there for members of the party. Um, and so, of course, the government became very interested in this research, and uh, they immediately moved him to Tallinn, Estonia, where he would be kind of out of the spotlight. Um, and he developed the system better and better until he could read the most infinitesimal things about people. Um, uh, so this is the installation that I did in Chicago at the International Symposium of Electronic Art. And uh, I hired essentially these Polish um, uh, women to dress as uh, scientist nurses. And um, uh, they would be standing by the apparatus. And if, there were, you know, if you happened to walk by, they would grab you and say, good, you're here for study, and throw you down in the chair. And your, your hair, head would then break this great beam of light. And um, this is a, a, a wall of um, you know, uh, uh, something like a 1,000 average faces from NKVD police files. Um, and what would happen is this analog camera would scan your face, then go back and forth, look at what faces you were similar to, then go through the NKB files to find out what was true about your personality. And, um, you know, as an artist, I, was, I, I figured the chance of someone hanging around for a long time was pretty slim or coming back often. So it was just like seven pages of text. Uh, about 80% were from the Soviet Union and likely to be false. Um, about 15% were from the Soviet Union and likely to be... Uh, or were, were, were general and likely to be true, and, and somewhere from the Soviet Union probably going to be um, not true for you. So, so at one point, this PhD in psychology came up to me afterwards. A PhD at the University of Chicago in psychology came up to me afterwards and said, "Oh wow, you know, I had no idea that this that this technology existed, especially not in 1968 in the Soviet Union. It was amazing. It did such a good job. It got all these things about me. So, out of five things." Four were right, one was, one was not quite right. I do love flowers by a sunlit window. Um, I've never skipped the Kalashnikov. Um, uh, I haven't been to Irkutsk. Uh, I do cook spaghetti al dente. And the last one, I don't know, you know, maybe I find Joseph Stalin attractive in a manly sort of way, but I've never really thought about it. And, um, and so what would happen, I mean, it's sort of reproving the Milgram experiments without meaning to. Um, I, I hadn't really even made the connection in my own work to Milgram at this point, but, but basically the apparatus was so realistic and it was so technical looking um, that people would give it this credibility and they would actually work to fit their personality to what the machine was telling them um, in this kind of remarkable way. Um, uh, and then finally, the last one I did that was kind of in this historical series was uh, called Natural Language Processor. And um, I don't know, the irony is just like, it just grows every time I show this. Um, uh, because a lot of this work is very related to my colleagues' work right now at the Media Lab, but this is um, uh, essentially trying to solve this age-old problem of babies and language. Um, so in Herodotus, there's um, a story of Herodotus sending out a uh, shepherd with two, um, two newborn twins, and, and the, the uh, king of Egypt sends, sends out the shepherd and he says, don't speak any language to these kids, and when they start speaking, bring them back, and we'll be able to know what the original language was. Um, and in Herodotus, the, eventually the kids are like two and a half, they start speaking, he brings them back, and the court scholars determine that it's Phrygian. Um, and, you know, again, like, I, I, I really want to try to reprove this, but uh, campus human subject laws prevent that from happening. So, um, so but this is a, a problem that has come up again and again in science. Um, uh, there's a, uh, a Great movie by Jean Pierre Dorin called Photo de Bengo, which Rebecca Baron gave me a copy of at some point, um, that, that basically uh, uh, shows 1970s research. And of course, there's a lot of contemporary research happening about this now. Um, uh, so, this is, um, these are, these are uh, footage of uh, Dr. Claude Schiever um, from MIT doing this work. Um, this is the installation in the Chiasma Museum in Helsinki. Um, it's a robotic bassinet unit. There's a ground glass on the front and um, a robotic slide projector which projects images onto the bassinet. Um, and uh, so things that a baby can recognize like bananas and breasts. Um, and uh, as they're presented on the ground glass, the baby makes a sound. 
Uh, the sound is correlated with the stimulus, uh, and it's recorded onto these gigantic um, random access tape players. Uh, and over the course of the day in the installation, um, uh, the baby would be presented with sounds, and then by the end of the day, it would kind of compress the entire study, and the machines would try to be engaged in the conversation. Um, with the baby. But of course, after Nuremberg, uh, the campus human subject boards were created across the US, uh, and the mothers were noticing that their babies were spending so much time in isolated isolation that they were being traumatized. So eventually, the study was canceled, um, uh, and the results were inconclusive. The only thing they could prove statistically was that there were over 35 words for milk. Um, so, um, so that's some of the stuff that I was doing um, before, uh, before I was at an engineering school. Um, but then uh, I, I got a job at um, Rensselaer Polytechnic, which um, is another obscure engineering school in the Northeast. And um, uh, I, as I was there, I realized I had this kind of onus to, um, to do contemporary technologies. And, and, uh, and I had been spending a lot of time in the libraries looking at the history of science and technology and I was very um, uh, I, I'd gotten very kind of like solitary and like you know I figured if I'm gonna live this lifestyle I might as well be an art historian and who wants to be that you know so um, so I decided that I would uh, I would have to kind of get back into the groove and, and, and start living a little bit more like an artist um, and uh, uh, and clubbing, and so um, so I, I decided to do this project um, based on a technology that I saw uh, uh, kind of coming up at that point. Um, this was around 1998, 1999. Um, uh, I saw that there, the, the DJ was becoming a kind of a powerful cultural icon again, and I, I uh, had been into DJing as a kid in Chicago, and I um, uh, had of course given it up, and, and uh, uh, I realized at this point I could never go back to it because I'd lost, you know, my skills. Um, <laughs> mad as they were, um, and, uh, and so so I, I decided that I had to um, I had to look at and, and and try to see if there was a technology that I could make for DJ. And what I noticed is that there were all these companies that were working on this. And the more I did research, the more I saw examples of companies that were trying to build DJ technologies. Um, but all the companies were in, you know, Japan, which you know has a good, relatively recent DJ tradition, and um, and California, which Northern California has a pretty good DJ tradition. But um, the kinds of people who were building the technologies didn't resemble the people who had built DJing. And what I love about DJing is that it's a, you know, this incredible cultural application of a misuse of technology. So, um, so. At the time, Matsushita, which is the, the Matsushita Heavy Industries, is the parent company of um, Panasonic, and Panasonic is the parent company of Techniques, and they were producing these record players called the SL1200 um, Mark I, which were these very good record players with these very heavy platters so that um, buses could go by your apartment and you know the, the record wouldn't skip. Um, and uh, and what was happening in Jamaica was that the uh, record companies were. Uh, promoting records by essentially holding these sound system parties in rural areas. So they would come up with a truck on a weekday and have a big party and go back and forth between turntables and then one of these guys called Herc moved to um, the Bronx and uh, kind of DJing got created. But the moment Matsushita heard about it in the, in the kind of mid-70s, um, they began to hear these rumors that people were taking their very delicate expensive turntables that can read sub-angstrom distances. Um, and they were going rah, rah, rah. And so Matsushita actually removed the, the Mark II SL1200 from the market because they thought that it was doing damage to their brand identity. That to me is what DJing is about. It's about engineers producing a technology, thinking it's gonna be one thing, and then a group of other people saying, no, it's gonna be something else, producing a really remarkable art form out of it. And what I saw was that all the technologies that were being made by these different companies in Japan and California were essentially making the claim that DJing was great, but there was some problem with the records, they were scratchy, they were analog, they were you know, somehow violating the manifest destiny of the digital that people like Nicholas Negroponte were you know, postulating at the time. And um, that to me seemed really strange. It seemed to me like saying, oh, you know, I love violin music. If it weren't for the damn violin, they're so squeaky. Um, it just seemed really problematic somehow, and um, and sort of w the marketing that these companies were beginning to have. Uh, there was a DJ who um, 
uh, uh, I won't mention his real name, but some call him Plastic Man, um, who had bought one of these companies and um, was actually marketing it by giving talks as a DJ, not mentioning that he owned the company, and saying, you know, as an international DJ, I'm constantly lugging these records, you know, on the airplane from Ibiza to Madrid, and you know, and uh, they're really heavy, and, and you know, and you know, they you can't see any information on them, and and he would make these arguments. And number one, yeah, records are heavy, but you know, if you're an international DJ going from Ibiza to Madrid, stop complaining. Um, you know, that's number one. Number two, he would make the claim that you couldn't see information on them, and there's an incredible wealth of information on vinyl, and good DJs can see it. They can literally lift the needle and drop it to a thousandth of an inch position consistently. I mean, the, there's nothing wrong with records, and no DJs were saying there was anything wrong with records unless they had a financial stake in these new companies. So I thought, okay, well, I can't really improve this very remarkable art form, um, uh, especially because it's a, based on a technological misuse. Um, but what I can do is I can perform a worse mistake than these companies are making. And so I set about essentially trying to reproduce um, the deep blue controversy in DJ by building a automatic DJ that would work without people and rather than re replace the vinyl, um, replace the humans. And, um, and uh, so, so uh, I started working on this and I started looking at um, great examples of how this process worked before. And, uh, for instance, the early steam era, it was very common for a marketer to, to go to the, to the rural America and, and basically challenge the strongest man or the strongest ox to a competition with one of his steam devices. And we have a very famous labor hero in the US, John Henry, who uh, famously fought one of these machines and beat it. But in the process, he herniated his entrails spilled to the ground and he lay down dead. And, um, and uh, you know, this is one of our heroes. And I thought, well, this is great. I could build the DJ Killer app and, um, and essentially build a device that would um, uh, compete with, with DJs and, and, uh, and hopefully kill them. Um, and so, um, so I, I basically took on the persona of an MIT professor, um, or an RPI professor, um, uh, and developed software where you could go through a record and code all the information into a database uh, and then randomly access that information uh, across multiple turntables. Um, and people would say, well, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. And I would say, well, I'm just doing what you know, famous artists, technology artists like Stellark have said in the past. You know, Stellark fundamentally believes that the body is obsolete and that we should all get ready for the next generation. I think this you know, allows people to DJ in environments that are too hostile for human beings. <laughs> Um, you know, like Chernobyl, and um, and so um, so uh, so we we did this research at RPI for about a year, and, uh, and then I took it to MIT with me, and um, uh, had one MN to work on the project for a while, because typically my grad students don't work on any of my work. But the um, uh, he so this is uh, the MN who was working on it, uh, Andrew Wong. Um, and uh, he basically was working with the idea of doing motion capture around the DJing. Um, and so uh, this is him whistling into a microphone. And this is, uh, it would take about two seconds to process, and this is the scratch being played back over a bird whistle. So what we could do is in real time live you know, battles with DJs, we could listen to what they were doing and then immediately recreate it over different material. Um, but you could also take, you know, the motion capture of like, you know, 80% uh, cool herb, 20% spooky, and, you know, come up with some new hybrid and stuff like that. So I'll show you some video, but um, first I just want to show, um, this plays into these media narratives that are so uh, incredibly predictable uh, that, that I was able to kind of go on all these different um, venues and I knew exactly how the reporter would play it. I knew exactly what I needed to say. And um, so this is from the BBC, and uh, this is an example of me representing MIT. It's three in the morning, and it's in Pontchartrain, and the DJ is on fire. The reason he's so good is that he's a robot. His creator, Chris Chicksetney Hyde, that's his real name, explains why well, he invented it. We're just trying to make human DJs obsolete as much as possible. Why is that? They're expensive, they're unreliable, they're all made of Making our campus proud. Um, 
So uh, this is the work that I was doing when I got to MIT campus. And I was, I was hired in um, August of uh, uh, 2001, and I got to campus September 5th, and uh, things were going pretty well for about a week. Um, and uh, uh, then, you know, um, well, actually, no, let me, let me just really quickly show a video. I'm sorry. Uh, let me show a quick video of uh, the system, the EJ working. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry, let me change my preferences. Okay. So the system used surplus servo motors from uh, Xerox machines. Because they were still at RPI, they didn't have much of a budget. Um, uh, honey, honeycomb aluminum, which is what aircraft cores are made out of. It's very light, which allows it to spin with the invisible hand. Um, uh, Turntable wires are donated free from Matsushita, uh, one of the Media Lab sponsors, actually. Um, and then hooked up to each turntable is a small microcontroller running uh, some calculus, uh, and it's hooked up on an industrial protocol called IRS 45, which allows uh, up to about 128 turntables. We stopped at seven. Um, and I worked with a variety of neurons, both at RBI and at MIT. Let me just list them. Uh, Jonathan Giroir, Jeremy Sudol, um, Lucy Mendel, Galen Picker, uh, this was four main ones. Um, uh, and they, they did a lot of the uh, high level coding, which I'm not very good at. I'm good at low level stuff. Um, so as we started doing the performances, um, initially it worked like a player piano. So we come out in track suits, uh, sometimes with chains, and, uh, and um, we set it up and we kind of you know pose a bit. And then we hit play, and then we'd stand back or like go off stage and smoke or something like that. And, um, it was really nerve wracking because since it used real turntables, there would sometimes be dust or uh, the stages were notoriously shaky. So if it ever went off, then the whole rest of the performance was ruined. And that happened very rarely, but it was really nerve wracking. So eventually we started thinking, okay, can we build in performance real time? And so this is the real time performance interface that we built, which essentially allowed us to do a variety of things like. Uh, scratch from this knob. And so what you could do is say, okay, I want this turntable and this turntable and this turntable to scratch from the knob. And since the knob is one inch diameter and the records are 12 inches in diameter, um, basically if you just were nervous or drink coffee, you could you know, do some really incredible scratching just by kind of <laughs> touching it and having your finger vibrate. Um, but what you could do is then is press a button and uh, as you press the button here, you can set a loop essentially, and so now it will continue to scratch that loop from then on. Um, you can also record that loop, bring it back later, and so if anyone's ever heard Thomas Friedman's album Flink, um, we could do some really nice noise work around that. Um, and um, so uh, I'll just show maybe. Um, well, let me just show uh, doing doing a second loop on top of the first. Now I'm selecting the far turntable. Okay, so now that, that one's working. And so essentially you can create these kind of layered textured patterns and we get about five or six turntables that would produce some really nice stuff. Um, I'll just show really quickly um, uh, a, uh, a little bit of a, kind of a setup. I pretty much, um, early on, I, I made the decision that um, every concert would start with Millie Vanilli. Um, <laughs> because I was sort of, um, you know, I was, I was uh, calculating the funk um, sort of, and so, uh, so it was, um, uh, yeah, so we'll start out with some Millie Vanilli, I think.
sort of uh, minimal techno of scratching uh, with several sources that's been vaguely forming rhythms. But um, it's important to acknowledge that I'm not that good an engineer, and um, uh, often those shows would end up or start in tragedy. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so I'm really glad now that I've been part of a research group where my students are much better trained than I was, um, uh, and can actually do things that work much better than anything I could have made. Um, so, um, so like I said, I got to campus in 2001, and um, things were uh, things things got pretty weird pretty quickly. One of the one of the things that I noticed was, um, uh, you know, I, I had a sense of how much military contracting there was at MIT, but almost every um, almost every area that I looked at, I saw this uh, kind of really dense penetration of uh, military ideology, command control, communication ideology, um, and you know, one of the first MIT initiatives after 9-11 was uh, uh, when Rodney Brooks announced that he was donating from his company. Rodney Brooks is the director of the uh, CSAIL now, but was the director of the AI lab. Um, he started a company called iRobot, which uh, does the vacuum cleaners, um, uh, displacing immigrant workers, but um, uh, also the uh, uh, iRobot um, military vehicles that are uh, essentially robots for warriors. And uh, he announced that he was um, going to create a system uh, for finding Osama bin Laden in the caves of Tora Bora. Um, and they actually sent the robots there to try to find bin Laden. And I, I thought, you know, this is really weird because if there's anything we've been spending money on, it's um, military uh, intelligence gathering technology. Um, so this, for instance, is a Global Hawk. Um, actually, it's a Global Hawk or better. It's a Global Hawk. Okay, thank you. Oh yeah, it's jet. Um, so, uh, so this is a, a device that can stay in the air for uh, over 24 hours um, uh, at high altitude and take really steady video of people getting killed. Um, and it's, it's an entire infrastructure of essentially creating and distributing snuff films. Um, uh, this is, this is uh, an example of what it takes to run one of these UAVs. Um, the cheapest ones are um, uh, in the, the tens of millions of dollars, uh, something like 20, 25 or 43 million dollars, I think, for the Predator. This is a Predator. Um, and uh, the interesting thing I remember seeing about these, because I'm a little bit of a plane buff myself, and I always heard that they were intelligence gathering devices, but the moment, right after 9-11, um, one of these gets a missile strapped onto it and assassinates a group of people in Yemen, including a U.S. citizen, um, who were presumably terrorists. And, um, Right after that, they assassinated another group of three people uh, in Afghanistan, one of whom was tall. And their rationale for killing the three people was that one was tall, um, because Osama bin Laden is tall. And, um, and of course, it had nothing to do with Osama bin Laden. It was three guys who were from a village that was about three kilometers away from where the uh, plane was. My guess is that if they'd sent ground troops, they would have figured it out. Um, uh, they would have been able to ask the guys where they were from. But instead, they went on the best information they had, which is that one guy was um, taller than the other two people. It was six foot, uh, it was, I think, five foot nine, and Osama bin Laden is six foot three or something like this. So you're talking about the difference between like me and Snoop, basically. But the other two guys were really short. and. Um, so I just, you know, I, I, I started looking at this and I, I thought, well, you know, before the war in Afghanistan started, uh, October of 2001, I, I started thinking, well, what's the biggest danger that I can imagine? And I, on the day of 9-11, I was watching cable and um, I was looking through these channels and I thought, this is just such a weird world. I don't understand what these commentators are talking about. Yes, this is a terrible thing, but does this mean that we need to react the way that we already seem to be reacting? You know, and I'm flipping through channels, and everyone's talking essentially like um, Fox talking points. I finally get to this one channel which shows this crying teenage girl, and she's sobbing, and she's like, I'm just really worried that the US is going to overreact and create all these problems because they're just going to overreact and, and strike out with the power that they have, and that this is going to create a much more dangerous world. And I thought, this is it, and it was Canadian broadcasting. <laughs> um, I was, I was so, I was so um, I, I realized I'm. I'm Secretly Canadian, so um, 
So, you know, controlling images is a huge issue um, on both sides of this conflict. And, um, and what, I, what I noticed, you know, this kind of um, twin, twin situation of a year before 9-11, um, the Taliban destroys these huge uh, images of the Buddha in Afghanistan. Um, and then uh, right after the invasion of Baghdad, we pull down, um, uh, and you've all seen this image again and again. What a lot of people haven't seen is um, photos with wide-angle lenses. Um, there was some talk last year about George Bush uh, um, making wide-angle lenses illegal because they keep causing these problems. How many of you saw during the anniversary of 9-11 he was standing on the American flag? Um, bad choice of uh, placemat for the wide-angle lens. Um, so all the press images show him and Laura, and if you zoom out a little bit, he's actually standing on the US flag, which is not coof in some area. Um, so this is, this is, these are images taken during the event. Uh, the night before Ahmed Chalabi and his friends um, get flown in on a US Army Air Force uh, plane, or a US Air Force plane, and that's Chalabi's uh, uh, bodyguard, one of the people who's celebrating the um, takedown of the sculpture, of which you can see there's about 100 people and everyone else is being kept from entering the square. Um, so to me, the question wasn't what are the you know what are the images that we're taking? What are the killer robots for Osama bin Laden? But how are we as citizens going to be able to look at the issue of war in Afghanistan and try to decide whether it's a just war, whether we're making the right choices, um, and whether whether we should go to wars in the future in the same for the same rationale? So uh, within a couple of weeks, I'm in a bar with some Spanish artists, and we're talking about. Um, uh, evil Bert, uh, in this very strange moment. And I started sketching out um, the, my idea for a robot war journalist called the Afghan Explorer. Um, and so uh, this is from the original cocktail napkin. Um, for sale, by the way, for the collectors and audience. And um, uh, the idea was that they could go talk to people, find out what was going on, discuss important issues with Afghans, um, maybe even make friends and promote international understanding. Um, and so uh, that week I got a call from, uh, three days after I had the idea, I got a call from the New York Times uh, who wanted to do a story about the DJ robot. And I said, well, you know, that project's kind of old. Um, I'm, I'm about to launch a new project. Uh, and he said, what is that? And I said, it's October 2001. It's, you know, a month after 9-11. And I'm like, oh, well, it's a robot war journalist. And he, he probably could tell something in my voice. And he said, how far along are you in the project? And I was like, oh, pretty far. <laughs> and, uh, we've made a lot of progress so far. And, um, and he said, well, do you have a website or something? And I was like, mm, sure. I haven't launched it yet. Uh, and so that night, I made the website. <laughs> um, and it's filled with these really uh, kind of awful um, racist things, like Afghani is a unit of currency, not a person. Um, Notice the interpreter is kind of fading out into the background. He's at 50% um, <laughs> capacity. Uh, and, and I had all these quotes like, um, well, you know, uh, the one it, it's very common for people uh, at MIT to build devices like this. They're all building Mars probes or deep space probes. It's just what we do when we want to go someplace that we can't or go to someplace that's too dangerous for us to travel. Um, you know, so I'm essentially doing the same thing. You know, but it's actually a lot easier to design for Afghanistan because it's not very radioactive yet. And, um, and, and so the website was filled with these kind of pre-post-colonial um, attempts at me playing a kind of like an engineer, engineering for development kind of guy. Um, and I uh, built these mock-ups. And then, you know, one of my students uh, noticed that America's Army had been released, this military video game that was being produced for free. And so uh, he developed a um, patch that would allow uh, <laughs> kids who were trained to be in the Army to practice with the robots and they wouldn't shoot it by mistake and recognize it as friendly. And, um, and it, it died down for a little while. And then when the war actually started, uh, it got this huge uh, surge of media. And so this is a guy named... Uh, Kevin Manny is a technology writer for uh, USA Today, and if you read the story, it's um, uh, there's a Taliban fighter trapped against a rock, and uh, up comes this robot, um, and uh, uh, Geraldo Rivera starts interviewing him and saying, "How does it feel to be in an airstrike by the US Army?" Um, and you know, Kevin Manny and all these journalists basically said, "Well, you know, we." We couldn't have gotten an article about press censorship by our editors, um, but we could get a technology editor, uh, technology article by. This is the Guardian, um, and this is where they actually asked the head of uh, um, uh, CENTCOM, 
what he thinks of the project. So this is when I knew that um, the military knew about it. Um, this is the largest uh, uh, Muslim daily in Indonesia, um, quoting me talking about how the U.S. as a culture is um, increasingly developing technology so that we don't actually have to experience war either as a soldier or as a journalist. Um, and uh, I'm kind of continuing this project on some level with some contemporary stuff um, uh, set for the low intensity warfare of the U.S. Mexican border. Um, uh, so, um, so that's that's sort of how we started doing some of the uh, work at uh, Computing Culture. Was uh, you know at that point I didn't have many students, and um, that was sort of a. Uh, our, our beginnings of an attempt to develop a, a tradition of technologies that work with government somehow. Let me show um, another one that was uh, kind of the first um, master's project that, uh, that went along this level. So this is the work of a student named Ryan McKinley, who about a year later in 2002 was trying to figure out what to do. And he, um, he had been trained as a computer science and art student at the University of California, San Diego. and. Um, uh, you know, was going through the same kinds of culture shocks at MIT that I was, and he was curious about um, another side of what was happening politically, which was this real change in the U.S. government and how the government worked. So they just had this energy task force when Bush had come into power before 9-11 that the government wouldn't say who had been invited to speak at it. Um, the John Ashcroft, the, um, uh, the head of um, uh, the Justice Department was telling U.S. government officials not to pay attention to freedom of information re re requests. So what was happening is that um, the government was accessing, uh, was limiting access to its records, um, and when they were releasing them, they were releasing them largely um, uh, uh, with, with um, black marker all over them. Um, and at the same time, they were passing laws that were allowing them to come into our homes, into our bank accounts, into our um, library accounts and figure out what we were doing all the time. So there's this huge kind of division of um, information between the two. And this kind of came to a head when we saw this DARPA Hard project, a $500 million project a year uh, called Total Information Awareness, um, which was the goal, which was to study everyone all the time in the US. And um, uh, we, we thought there were a couple of things wrong with it. One, of course, the, the icon that they were using. Um, uh, but um, and this is from their website. Um, basically, they were trying to gather all this information of all sorts of kinds and put it into this um, database uh, to calculate who was a potential terrorist. And we thought that there were a couple things wrong with this. One, that um, this was illegal. Um, and the government was saying, well, we are just doing this so that we can better understand privacy concerns. So, um, it was remarkable. They, they claimed that the entire point of this mission was so that they could better understand privacy concerns and build systems that would be able to get and retrieve this information without someone's identity being known unless they were considered to be a threat, which is great if there are no false positives. If there are false positives, it doesn't really matter. Um, and you know, second off, you know, historically, every time a government gathers this kind of information, it's trouble for moose and squirrel. And then finally, um, uh, we know about, a lot about computing, and we, we knew that there wasn't anything that could go process that data right now that would be accurate enough that would prevent false positives or um, uh, you know, just as bad in some ways false negatives. So my student um, started, we, we met some researchers who were doing this work, and we um, uh, loosened their lips. And, um, and uh, uh, in the meantime, TIA kept changing their icon um, because it was generating so much pressure on them. But, um, but eventually my student proposed this for his master's thesis, um, which is essentially um, a system that uh, uh, can gather, um, uh, allow people to update information about government officials that they know. For instance, if you're at a dinner with John Kerry and you see he has a couple too many drinks, or um, if you're uh, uh, a paramour of, um, you know, uh, uh, like your 14-year-old page um, of, uh, of a congressperson, um, you know, you can upload information anonymously about these government officials that then uh, uh, it's an uploaded anonymously, but you have an identity like with eBay, so eventually you can get, you know, stars next to your name uh, for having consistently gotten things correct. Um, and uh, and uh, we can eventually take information from the government without its permission in the same way that the government is taking information from us without our permission. 
And um, you know, we'll never know how successful the project was. Uh, technically, it was a disaster, I have to say. We uh, launched it thinking that we would, you know, the student had run sites that had tens of thousands of simultaneous hits that were interactive. Um, we were immediately getting millions of simultaneous hits, um, uh, and the site started crumbling. So a bunch of Media Lab people came to our rescue, um, added a server a day for six days, at which point we were serving about 50% of the static requests that we were getting. And that's, that's a lot. Um, that's, that's millions and millions of simultaneous users. So it turned out to be, there was a need that we were fulfilling. Um, uh, and um, and you know, the students started by looking at C-SPAN 1 and 2 and digitizing people's faces, uh, recording the transcripts of what people are saying, because um, if you actually look at the congressional record, one of the things that people are allowed to do when they're speaking before Congress is the first thing they'll do when they stand up, they say, we'd like to re uh, request the right to revise our statements. Um, uh, and if it's granted, which it always is, they can then sit down again and then have lobbyists send about seven or eight pages of what they claim to have said, and that will actually go into the congressional record as if the senator had said it, um, which is remarkable. But um, So you can match what the senator actually said before a vote with what they claim later to have said. Um, we quickly built up a database of about 8,000 politicians, um, and you could very quickly look to see who their funders were, um, what church they went to, what fraternity they belonged to, um, all of this vital information you need to know. Uh, and very quickly click through uh, these patterns. And so it was really a boon for conspiracy theorists. Um, uh, you could very quickly blame everything on the Albanians. Um, and in fact, people were telling us, you, because of your activism, may be targeted for elimination using directed energy or microchip covertly to cause you to be incapacitated or killed. And, um, uh, and it, was, it, was a, it was a heady time. It was, a, it was a, um, the best of times and the worst of times. It was, it was quite a remarkable uh, moment in both of our lives. Um, so uh, just to show kind of what I'm doing, uh, what I'm doing locally, um, I'm developing this UAV, which is an open source, very cheap unmanned aerial vehicle that one can build um, using basically a, a trip to a Home Depot and a trip to a hobby store. Um, so it takes me now about three hours to build it, which I've had so much practice from because it keeps crashing. Um, but it can, it can lift a camera uh, and stay aloft for about four and a half hours. Um, so it's unlike anything that you can buy at the moment. And, um, and the idea is for the immediate groups uh, or human rights groups to be able to use this as a way to, I don't know, say, overfly places on the edge of Cuba where they want to find out information that they're not able to get right now. So, um, so just as an example. Um, but uh, what we've been doing is uh, trying to use it to monitor, uh, I have to say unsuccessfully so far, to monitor the Minutemen on the U.S.-Mexican border who are um, these right-wing fascist extremists who um, basically go out and harass, steal the shoes of, or assault um, uh, immigrants um, crossing the border. Uh, so, um, uh, this is the work of Tad Hirsch, who, while he was in the group, developed an application for uh, iPods, or for PDAs called IC, which allows you to track and record video cameras in Manhattan um, and chart a path, of, a path of least surveillance across the city um, if you want to avoid as many cameras as possible. Um, he also did a project called TextMob, which uh, essentially allowed activists at the RNC to develop a very interesting progressive communication system uh, to bypass the police and, and um, keep track of each other and uh, really, really dramatically balanced uh, the, the power between the police and the protesters at the RNC. Everyone I knew who was there um, said that it was uh, uh, remarkably reformulated the, um, uh, the protests themselves. Let me just show a little bit of footage though of Ryan. Um, sorry for those of you who've seen this 10 or 15 times before, but show a little bit of footage of Ryan because all of these projects are both uh, essentially trying to create a new technology. Okay, essentially trying to create. A new, I'll take ten. Thanks. Um, uh, trying to create a new technology that, um, uh, but at the same time, engender some kind of discourse in a public forum. Um, and so um, this is uh, uh, this is um, this is Ryan kind of doing that work, talking about total information awareness. Talking, asking the question, what kind of society do we want to have? Uh, what are the technologies but that we want to build? They are citizens. They have a monitoring service of their own. Ryan McKinley, a graduate student at MIT, has created an internet database that may help consumers keep tabs on government activity. Good thing. 
Well, what exactly have you set up here? A system that has sort of two key parts. I've written a lot of parsers that get existing sources, so lots of public documentation, and then I'm working on ways for citizens to add more information to that, so that we can have we can really harness the collective knowledge of the American citizen. It can be very invasive of the privacy of government officials. Uh, aren't you concerned about doing to government officials what you're concerned they may be doing to others? We live in a world where lots of personal information is traded about us daily, credit card numbers, our uh, financial histories. And so if it's legal to, to sell it kind of secretly behind us, it, it feels like it must be legal to share it publicly. Hey, did you get a grade for this project yet? Um, I'm trying to graduate with this project. <laughs> the Total Information Awareness Program, or TIA. But some folks at MIT think it can think I understand your, your uh, leeriness about having the government, uh, you know, in this time of terror, look through so many people's information. So you've come up with this new website where you're inviting anybody with fingers and a keyboard to type in and essentially tackle on politicians, right? It just seems like this is the first perfect opportunity for somebody with an axe to grind to sandbag a politician who's just simply trying to do their job. Somebody with an axe to grind to sandbag a politician who's just simply trying to do their job. And I'm looking at this more as a process, uh, as, a, as a way to sort of give us a hope of maintaining a democracy as the technologies we're developing are building a very dangerous, asymmetric uh, balance of power. So after Ryan's hands stopped trembling as much, um, he started uh, working, uh, uh, essentially trying to build his system so that it would be able to handle a lot of hits. And uh, he's the programmer who developed um, Instructables.com, if anyone's seen that. Um, uh, so Instructables is uh, uh, kind of an open source uh, place for people to um, uh, share how to build crazy things. Um, and it's right now getting uh, a really large number of simultaneous uh, users, something like uh, 9 million discrete users a week. So it's at the point now where he's getting ready to go back uh, to, to the system and essentially create, uh, create a new version of it. Um, it might look a little bit different, but um, uh, it'll be kind of somewhat similar. Um, just to show some of the more uh, kind of personal politics projects, um, this one's, uh, I would say, kind of a failure uh, in some ways. This is by Lamore Freed, who was looking at the technology, uh, the ways that it affects people's interpersonal relationships. And what she decided was that cell phones are making people really rude um, by having them uh, essentially speak very loudly in public when they're standing right next to you and things like that. And so she decided to build this piece of jewelry that she could wear. She open sourced it. Um, which, if you press the button, it would disconnect any cell phone within about three meters. Um, and uh, so you could take it with you to the Starbucks or whatever and um, essentially disconnect someone else's phone. Uh, it worked really well. In fact, it worked so well that about two weeks after she developed the technology, um, she got an email from a corporal in uh, the Air Force and the Department of Energy. And this was kind of a weird phone call, or a weird email. And he, was, he just wrote her and he said, Oh, so you're putting this online, it's open source, so uh, wow, this looks better than anything we have right now, thanks. And um, it's amazing on two levels. One, something that she designed basically to avoid loud conversations in elevators was being used to deactivate IEDs in Iraq. Um, and number two, how much are we paying the DOD? Uh, that my MN student comes up with a thesis project that is better than anything they've got right now. It was, it was both shocking and, co and confusing. Um, but um, uh, the, the real, uh, the PhD student who's doing a lot of this remarkable work is Kelly Dobson. Um, uh, she's been um, developing essentially a set of domestic objects. So I'm just going to show two more short videos. I'm sorry. Um, a set of domestic objects that uh, are uh, somehow interacting with an emotional space or a personal space that are quite different um, uh, than, than any that most companies would, would design for. Um, let me just find this video. There we go. Um, and so in this case, she was looking at uh, domestic objects she uses all the time. Uh, blender, and every time she uses it, her cat would run out of the room, and she 
at first thought, stupid cat, you know, um, but then she realized the cat had something, you know, the blender's a terrible object, it makes this terrible noise. Um, so, so she started thinking, what if you had to use some kind of intellectual honesty or emotional honesty to use a blender? feedback loop and stuff like that. And someone, you know, talks about this as being uh, on some level a chindoku, but I, I really disagree with that interpretation. I think that these are um, on some level necessary technologies. Um, sorry, chindokus are uh, pointless designs. It's a Japanese tradition of designs for useless objects, but I think um, uh, in every one of our cases these are tremendously useful objects. Um, so um, uh, just to kind of show uh, 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 this last video and two last projects, Kelly has been um, uh, kind of continuing to do this research uh, around emotional spaces. One of the things she's looking at, one of the biggest kind of research efforts in domestic technologies is in uh, care bots, um, uh, robots that are supposed to live with people, um, help take care of them. And all of this research is funded under the idea that um, these statistics that people found a few years ago that uh, elders who live with pets live much longer. Um, and so this is, for instance, a still from the Carnegie Mellon Elder Care Robot Project. Um, uh, this is a huge growth industry, very, very important in Japan, uh, also increasingly important in the US. And so this is a CMU researcher who I happen to know is about 25 years old, dressed up to look like an old lady. And you can already tell that there's something very wrong about this research. Um, that, that she had to strap a panty, fanny pack and like um, padding in order to look old because they couldn't actually get an old person. But the other thing that's really remarkable about this, this industry initiative is they keep making the claim that um, somehow uh, this pet statistic shows that if elders were to live with these robots, they would live happier lives longer. But when you actually look at the robots, they all are norm normativizing devices, essentially. They all remind you to sleep or to call your grandkids or to take drugs. And I have a feeling that if pets did that, people wouldn't live longer. And so what's amazing is this entire industry is getting off on essentially the wrong foot, trying to figure out how to control people through technology in this very weird way. And so Kelly's essentially looking at um, the source of her own healthfulness, which she believes is largely yoga, and trying to develop yogic robots that somehow interact with her in yoga. And the first thing she had to do was figure out what is a robot that you would want to have next to you. And so she started researching skins, and she ended up developing what I think is the first jacquard loom based system that uses stainless steel threads. Um, and so by weaving this into a cloth, you can essentially develop a very dense sensor skin. Every few millimeters can be a resistive or a capacitive sensor that's both detecting pressure and presence of the person. Um, and so she, uh, she did, did this cloth uh, on the Jacquard loom, and it feels essentially like an airplane blanket. It's stainless steel, but it feels really just as good as wool. Um, and it has, uh, essentially, she's going to show now how to use it as a resistive sensor. So she's pressing, and as she presses, the resistance changes. Um, but you can put as many sensors into this as you want, or as few. Um, here it is acting as a capacitive sensor. Um, so she's going to put this on the outside of these robots that are essentially just going to breathe along with you. Um, and so if you sit next to it on the sofa, it'll be sitting there like a pillow, and as you breathe, it'll gradually begin to breathe along with you. Um, and so I can show a video of that. I think some of it's on our website as well now. But uh, this is the last piece that I'll show. This is by Aya Badir, and Aya is a uh, Lebanese student who joined my group um, as an engineer. She hadn't done any art projects before. And um, as she was flying back to the US, she kept getting searched. 
Um, she would be searched as many as four times per flight, um, randomly. And, uh, and some of the searches were really okay searches that she didn't mind. Some of the searches were more intrusive, and a couple of them were really bad. But she finally kind of started to lose it when she flew back to the US one time after winter break. And uh, she was taken to the interview room that some of you might have seen people waiting in line to go into this room. She talked to the head of um, uh, uh, security at Logan. Um, well, the head of, um, I think he actually works for DHS, if I'm not mistaken, through the TSA. Um, and so, um, so he had a, a long interview with her, um, and he was asking her all sorts of questions that she wasn't quite sure about. And uh, she was surprised. She thought that they were essentially kind of like psychological tests to see her reaction, because uh, they had to do with her private life, her personal life, things like this. And at the end of the interview, the guy slid his notebook across her, and he said, you understand that it's at my you know, prerogative to uh, put you on an airplane if I consider you to be a threat to the United States. I can put you on an airplane and send you out. And she said, yes, I understand that. And he, he said, could you give me your, your home number? I'd be really interested in having dinner with you. And she was left in this position of not knowing whether this was still part of the interview, whether this was a test, or whether he was you know, harassing her. And so she made a split-second decision. She you know, wanted to graduate, and she said, I'll, I'll give him my number. And she kind of assumed that he wouldn't call, and he called her um, for the next several nights. And um, this is a guy who everyone in the Middle Eastern community on MIT campus knows, um, because he's kind of a well-known official. And she wasn't sure what she should do. You know, if she issues a complaint, is he going to retaliate? You know, is he going to abuse power? He's already demonstrated that he can abuse power. Is he going to do it again? So she started thinking, what can I do for people in my situation? And so she, she started thinking about that search space, not, not that search space, but the space of searches in airports. Um, um, she developed a system which also uses a different kind of sensing system called quantum tunneling composite. And she built an outfit, um, this is a, a prototype of it, that has a variety of pressure pads on it. And, um, and the quantum tunneling composite can read micrograms uh, several hundred times a second. And so as she's being searched, she can quantify that process. It uses a small microcontroller, a watch battery, and, um, and an SD card to record the search. And it passes through all metal detectors um, unnoticed um, because the cloth is distributed widely enough and the, the sensor itself is an electronic device. So she can actually pass the, the hand wand, the, the uh, gar garret hand wand, without it going off um, uh, for the suit. So this is a device that so immediately she wrote a letter to the TSA saying, I'd like to give this to you as a training device so that you can establish norms and variations in what a regular search is like. Um, no response. Um, but the other idea is that it can be worn uh, by people and just the fact of its existence, once we haven't done a public announcement of it yet, but the fact of its existence will probably change the behavior of people doing the searches because they have no idea whether someone is wearing this or not. And so it's sort of like the Rodney King or the recent surveillance tapes in LA. Um, the idea is to kind of create a situation where we come up with a parody technology that does surveillance on people in power so that they act more responsibly. <coughs> so thank you very much. I'm sorry to go over about 10 minutes. Thanks. Yeah, well, uh, so the argument that, that the government would have is that uh, the US has achieved its kind of technological domination through a process of spending most of the money on defense 
related equipment, and then it trickles down to the general public. I absolutely don't believe that that's true. I think it's a, it's, it's a crime. I think it's a terrible, terrible way of setting technology policy. Um, I think if you look at the number of spin-offs that are useful to the general society, they're a tiny fraction of the amount of money that's spent on defense technologies. But I guess in this case, I could just make the argument, oh, well, eventually those reactions to our reactions are going to trickle down, uh, and they'll be using your toaster or washing machine or whatever. Um, if I were to be more serious about it, I would say, you know, uh, it's really insignificant. Um, you know, the, the, the TIA project was $500 million a year. The NSA wiretapping is probably double or triple that. You know, any effect that we're having right now is a small, tactical, local effect. Uh, you know, at worst, I wake up in the mornings and I say we're, well, actually, I was giving a lecture one time to some SDS people, and the guy who's giving a talk at SDS on December 4th, by the way, Matt Wisniewski, he raised his hand and he said, so are you like the Stephen Colbert of engineering? <laughs> and like, at worst, that's what we're doing. Um, but at best, some of these things are having an effect. I mean, Afghan Explorer was at least heard of by the head of CENTCOM, you know, the, the person in charge of the war in Afghanistan. You know, so on some level, I, my advisor when I was in art school said the only reason to do work is to engage in a dialogue with people that you care about. That's what you know, a scientist is doing, that's what an artist is doing, that's why you do work. And on some level, with the DJ project, I was engaging in dialogue with DJs, partying with them. Um, in the case of the Afghan Explorer, I was engaging in not quite a, well, it was a dialogue of sorts with the US military and also with the media. Um, and so each of these projects is situated to kind of do that work. And I think, you know, Aya was in a kind of funny way engaging with the TSA as well. Um, she's getting a lot of letters saying, no, we're not going to explain our security policies here. Um, and so it was this sort of interesting back and forth, and, and she was trying to have an effect on the TSA. We haven't announced the project yet. I'm curious to see whether it will have an effect, but um, it will certainly bring up the issue of searches and the randomness and the you know, racial profiling that happens in searches. And so on that level, we're having a small effect, but you know, we're not really going to be wasting too many people's tax dollars. That's the one that everyone asks first, and and um, no, 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 no. It's uh, not the okay. Really, where, where do you get um, right. the funding? Because yeah. we have that this place on funding, and the other one is how do you prevent? Um, I mean, we had before a much lecture like, about the use of technology. I mean, nevertheless, we develop technology, and like what is happening, we use the accomplishments. How do we deal with that? Just as an example, I hope that many of you have seen the current exhibition at the like one of the artists uh, works with uh, Snell, so she developed this project, uh, the perfume of uh, like a fragrance of the smell of fear, and believe it or not, she got a call and she got an, an email from the University of Wisconsin who works collaboratively with the CIA uh, on detecting people who are potential terrorists at airports. So they thought like to work with um, her detecting the smell of fear might help them and actually they came here to MIT after she refused to see them and said, oh, it's, but it's a public exhibition, so we're allowed to see the exhibition of this And I found it very interesting. So we sometimes say, oh, this is a conspiracy series, but I mean, she was completely shocked when it happened to her. Like, she's a Norwegian artist, like, was just here for short. Sure. So I just don't know, how do you go about, like, I mean, how do you protect what do you know for being abused and on the other side? Where does the money come from? You have to Yeah, so uh, the, the latter one first, um, the money that we have to work with comes primarily from corporate sponsorship. I think it's about 75 to 80% corporate sponsorship right now. Um, but the lab right now is working under a model where um, some of the funding that comes in is centralized and distributed then to the groups. Um, based on you know negotiations or, or needs of the group, so uh, the you know the, the primary cost object for my group is graduate student tuition and my salary and the partial salary of an administrator, which works out to I think 97 percent of our budget. And the discretionary funding we get is, is actually surprisingly small. Um, uh, I think people would be shocked. I probably shouldn't say, but um, but uh, it's on the orders of thousands of dollars rather than. You know, uh, tens of thousands of dollars. So, um, so 
you know, what, what we give, um, especially European and Japanese sponsors, is a sense that all America isn't crazy. Um, uh, we, we have produced a bunch of primary technologies like the cloth that I showed last that sponsors have been interested in. Um, uh, two sponsors wanted to buy GIA. Um, we told them, well, it wouldn't make sense because, you know, if you're bought by Fox News Corp, um, then it won't, it won't be a, a neutral site anymore. So uh, we worked with them to show them some of the underlying technologies. You know, so what's happening is the students are primarily designing art projects or social activist projects, and then what's happening is they're developing primary technologies in the process that are really different than a lot of other university research departments would be developing. So, um, you know, right now, uh, for example, a student of mine named uh, um, Adam Witten, actually this, this project here is um, a system for uh, working with domestic views, and uh, I don't know how the project's gonna end, but he's essentially working with domestic abuse um, uh, victims to try to come up with ways of doing self-counseling and self-reporting. The primary technique for domestic abuse victims is to keep a journal so they can have a sense of changes in how things are happening. Uh, and this is a way of kind of uh, building that so they can um, objectively see the impact that's happening on their body. He shows this work to an uh, industry representative from Honda, and Honda has just done this robot project called ASMO, which is a huge material investment for them. It's this robot that's about this high and can run around and do things. But it's about as complicated as a car. They had to build whole factories to kind of tool, tool it out. And it's not working that well because it's got this hard shell. It looks like a spaceman. And it doesn't interact with people at all. And so they looked at Adam's work and they said, can you build clothes for our robots that will extend their functionality? It's crazy. You know, and the lab, media lab has worked in textiles for a while now, but no one had the idea of doing clothes for robots on some level. So, um, we're now engaged with Honda on doing this, you know, and, and um, but, you know, this is great for Adam because he's trying to figure out how he's going to survive as an artist, how he's going to continue to be able to do work that is uh, both, you know, primary technology but also has some kind of social component. Um, for him, this would be a great kind of part-time job that he can use to, to consult with Honda and stuff like that later. So, um, so that's, that's kind of, that's in a sense how we're getting value back. What was the other part of the question? Oh, how do we, so we can protect it from being misused, you know, but no one can protect anything from being misused, and I think that's the, um, that's the lesson that Matsushita learned with the SL 1200. They, after a couple of years of having the turntable off the market, they ended up having to put it on because there was so much request, and it's now being used by coke addicted syphilis transmitting DJs around the world. So, um, so, so the, you know, I, I've got a PowerPoint on here that I can't show you that's a, a PowerPoint of IEDs in Iraq, and they're made out of digital wristwatches, they're made out of um, you know, TV remote control devices. Um, the problem, you know, for me is that Iraq as a crisis exists because of military technologies. If it hadn't been for, you know, Saddam Hussein getting technologies to fight the Iranians, um, uh, gas technology from the U.S. It hadn't been for us building a system where he could remain as a dictator through our technologies. Um, and if it hadn't been through the war in Iraq, we wouldn't be having the IED problem. So I think if society were to somewhat reshift its priorities, we would not have this extensive misuse, this very this renaissance of bomb making that's happening in Iraq right now um, is not happening because of TV remote controls. It's happening because of this radical arms industry, which is producing a a system that's so one-sided that people are trying to respond to it and, and you know take take power away in the only way that they can. So you know, I was I was happy that this cell phone device got used for an IED deactivator. I thought that was great. I thought it was a really great use. But you know, the system could be used for much more nefarious things, and, and that's that's why they're illegal in the U.S. to to sell, which is why she ended up putting it open source on her site so you can rebuild it from home. Um, but, uh, but, you know, uh, it's, it's a complicated space and I think that what we're trying to do is create a bunch of exemplars that show a very different relationship between technology and society and, you know, the case of Lamore with the cell phone deactivator, for me, that project failed in a way because she was looking at the problem, which is that all domestic technologies are about empowering the individual and that the individual in our society is the human of consumption. Uh, except for educational, military, or you know, voting machines, a couple of other technologies like that, it's all oriented around the individual. And you, if you sell a technology that empowers the individual, you'll make money. And so cell phones empower the individual, but they often disempower society. Cars do the same thing. 
in the end, what Lamour did is she overemphasized that problem. And I think what I'm hoping computing culture is going to be doing in the future is actually avoiding that problem and trying different things. And so um, uh, I think there are several projects in the group that have actually circumvented this problem and created exemplars for a different way of working. So that's what I'm hoping we'll do. And of course, it's going to be misused. Power can think strategically. We have to think tactically. Anything we do is going to get reincorporated by power in one way or another. So we can't avoid that. But, um, in the meantime, we can do as much tactical work as we can. Yeah, one more. What's the question from the audience for that? Yeah. No? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Okay. Um, is the VAP student who's been trying to get in touch with me for a really long time here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you too. You? Okay, great. Yeah. Let's talk. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay. Okay. okay, thanks very much. Thank you.